Hi, this is Eric Martin with Board Game Geek. I'm here today looking at Vetlauf nach El Dorado, a design by Reiner Knizia, published by Ravensburger in early 2017. In English, this would be Race to El Dorado, and that is indeed what you were trying to do. Get to El Dorado first, across the forest and the waterways and the villages, and if you're there before anyone else, then you win. This game has a deck building element to it, but it really is all about the racing. With two to four players trying to get there first, maximize their deck in terms of how they do things, but really get there first. That's the focus you have to keep in mind as you're playing. So this game has been nominated for Spiel des Jahres in 2017. I've played a half dozen times now on a press copy from Ravensburger, so I thought I'd tell you how it works. Here's one of the many setups possible for El Dorado with the hexagonal tiles being laid out in a path with players trying to go from the start to El Dorado on the end point. And the rule book contains seven different layouts. This setup, this starting setup that I have here, too easy, too medium, too difficult, where you use different sides of the hexagonal tiles or the skinny tiles right here in some arrangement. And of course they have rules for how you can make your own paths. You connect each piece, each two pieces, with one of these obstacle tiles, which is laid out at random, which serves two purposes in the game, which I'll explain in a moment. Everybody has the same deck of movement cards to start with. You have one that moves over a single water space, three that move over forest, four that move over villages, deserts, not exactly clear what this tan thing is, because the rules don't explain, but we'll go with villages. You all start with the same deck, and you shuffle that deck and put it down on your little helper board here, which has explanations of what you're doing in German. The English version will be out before the end of 2017. You have a market of six cards, or six types of cards, with three cards in each pile. And these are always the cards that start in the market, with everything else just laid off to the side. At the start of each of your turns, you'll have four cards in hand, and you may play as many of those cards as you want in order to move your explorer or to buy one card from the market. Most of the cards have colored numbers on them, green, blue, or yellow, to match the landscape on the board, and you can play those cards to move across the landscape. You may notice that each of the landscape tiles has one or more symbols on it and you need a card at least that high in order to move into that space. So if I play a one forest, I can move one sp space in the forest. To enter this space with two machetes here, I cannot play two ones, but I must play at least one two, or a three or a four, whatever you wanna have for the forest cards. So if I play this two, I can move into this space. If I had a three, I can move into this space and I'd have one machete left over and I could continue moving. So you play as many cards as you want. So I could play forest to move here, forest to move here, the water to move here, and the village to move there. That'd be my entire turn. I fill my hand to four and then the next player goes in clockwise order and we continue taking turns. Alternatively, I could stop moving. Maybe I stop moving here. So I have this card still in my hand. All of the yellow cards also count as coins, worth as many coins as the number on the card. So this is worth one coin. And the cost to buy any card is shown on the bottom of that card. So instead of moving into this village, I can instead spend this one coin to buy this market card, which is worth one. It goes in my discard pile. And when I shuffle all my cards, this one I'll be in the deck, letting me get through forest a little more quickly. Each card that you don't spend that isn't yellow can be used as a half of a coin. So I could just move one space, save this for two coins, and now I can buy this if I want, which is worth two coins on its own in addition to being two, uh, two movement points through yellow spaces. I could buy this joker, which is worth one of my choice one or one coin if I'm buying. You decide what you want to do with each of your turns. So if I do this, I buy this coin, this goes my discard. If you have any cards left in your hand, you can keep them or you can discard them, it's up to you, and then you refill your hand to four cards. So my next turn I'm gonna have this, which doesn't help me much 
here because I know I can only move one space, but now I've got three money and I can buy this or this and so on. And we continue taking turns. Now, some cards have a X on them, an X through a rectangle, and this means this is a one-shot card. You use this once and it's gone. So it costs only three coins to give me a one-shot four coin injection. I can spend it for half a coin and I don't lose it. But once I want those four coins or four movement points to get through this central spot, perhaps, that card is gone. What happens when the market gets emptied out? So if we empty this space here, all these cards have been bought by someone, there's an empty spot on the market. And this opens up the market to everything else. I can buy anything that I can afford from among the piles here. And whatever I do buy, well, one of those cards goes into my discard pile, and the other two cards fill that empty spot on the market. So now I am deciding what other people can purchase. This ability to manipulate the market is one of the neat things about the game that I don't think I've seen in other deck building games. Usually you have this fixed array of cards that you can purchase, a la Dominion, or a random filling of cards as in Ascension. You don't have a choice over what you're going to buy. It's just either already there or presented to you at random. And this affects the game in, in some ways because what you are doing, of course, is determining what other people can also get. And you making choices on where you're going through the jungle or waterway or villages or what have you is going to determine what you want to put in your deck and how you want to manipulate your deck. And then other people might do different things. And of course, they wanted something else at a particular time. And now you have stopped them from getting that. So this sort of timing of the market is one little element of the game that keeps you on your toes constantly. What are you going to buy? And will that open up the market for somebody else to get something that they think they want? That card won't matter right away. Because of course, when you buy it, it goes in your discard pile but it'll get shuffled through in a couple of turns. So you got this little look ahead for what's coming and what you want now, and you gotta work that out ahead of time. The game boards have a few other elements on them, such as these gray spaces. When you want to move into a gray space, you have to discard as many cards as depicted. So I discard any single card from my hand, and I can now move into this space. I can discard something else. And now again, I'll need a green, or I need a blue if I wanna backtrack my way and work around in this direction. The red spaces, you're actually removing cards in your hand from the game, which of course is one of those deck thinner things that people love in deck building games. You want to optimize your deck, get rid of the garbage, upgrade, get better stuff. But in the starting setup, there are a few places to do that, and they are far away from where you might normally think about going. The quickest path out is of course straight, but you'd have to circle all the way over here. And then if you want to multiple discards, you have to go in and out of the path in order to remove things. Uh, it's quite difficult, but depending on the setups that you have, those spaces will be more or less valuable. You have these dark gray mountain spaces and you just can't go into them. So don't even think about them. They're just blockers all the way across the board. Now the obstacles that we mentioned here, they serve two purposes. One is to serve as a barrier for the leading player. It slows them down. The first player to get up to this space can choose to discard the appropriate card. So I discard one blue and this is removed and no one else has to worry about paying for it. I've blazed that trail. This one you'd have to have two forest on a single card. This one you discard any card from your hand. Now this serves a secondary purpose, a tiebreaker. The game ends the round that one or more players reach El Dorado. And if only single players reach El Dorado, that player wins. If more than one has, then whoever has more obstacles wins. And if there's a tie for a number of obstacles, well, whoever has the highest valued obstacle wins. This has a value of four, this one is five, and they go one to six because there are six different obstacles. So small thing to shoot for, when you are leading the pack is try to get these things. But of course, that's wasting movement that I could have used to actually move into this space. So you decide what you want to spend when the time comes. What are some of the other cards available in the market? You have movement through forests, through villages, for money. You have this machete here, this item. It's six movement through the forest, and then you throw it away. It gets all 
dull, does nothing anymore. You have the purple ones, which provide some special powers with some German text. Uh, not too difficult to get over. You translate it, you'll get used to the symbols very quickly. Uh, one is to discard this and take any card of your choice from the market and put it in your discard pile. Whatever you want. Doesn't matter what spaces are free or not. Yeah, this one. Draw two cards and then remove two cards in your hand from the game. It's a one-shot effect. You have another one. Draw one card and then if you wish, remove a card in your hand from the game. Draw two cards. Advance into any space, which sounds awesome and which dominated our early games, but you are moving only one space with this card. And if you are instead buying uh, this pioneer or a journalist or a millionaire or a captain, you can advance through many spaces in a single card play. So this is good, but not necessarily the best. It does let you ignore whatever is there. So I don't have to discard three cards. I just move there. I don't have to remove cards from the game. I just walk in, ignoring the lava pit or whatever is here. Finally, a compass, draw three cards, remove this from the game. Okay, Those are the variety of the cards, and they're the same in each game. You always see what's there, and your choices determine what comes into play and then what gets cycled into your deck. You continue play until one player reaches El Dorado, and you then see who wins. There's an overview of El Dorado, which, as I've said, I played a half dozen times with two, three, and four players. One small change for two players is that each player has two explorers, and you must get, be the first to get both of them to El Dorado. Now, this changes the nature of the game somewhat, because, as I mentioned at the opening, El Dorado is really a race game. It's built as a deck building game. It's Canizia's take on deck building. I talked with him a little at the Spielvar and Mesa trade fair, and he said he had tried to take a different approach, something that he would be satisfied with. Okay, well, every designer likes to say they put their own spin on things, but this does feel different because the deck building is kind of this subsidiary element to the racing in as a whole. This seems more along the lines of something like Ave Caesar um, or Turf Master or, or something else where you have a hand of cards and you're going to be spending cards from, and then pulling more cards. Right? It's more about the hand management rather than the deck management because at least with the easy setups, I found that the game is much more focused on racing than deck building. You can try to optimize your deck for these long-term giant plays with pioneers and millionaires that are going to let you move vast amount of distance in one turn, but it takes a lot of turns to set that up, to buy things and then upgrade and upgrade and upgrade and try to strip cards out of your hand. And while you're doing that and focusing on that, other people are actually moving through the forest and they will get there first. Usually, it, it, it's hard to know for sure. As we got into the more difficult stages, deck building seemed to play more of a role just because there were tougher challenges, more bottlenecks where you go through this one area where it's like three forest or you take this long path that's one forest all the way around. So what's gonna be better? If you don't have a three forest card, you cannot pass through that space. So you have to decide what you wanna do. When you get into the two player game though, it changes things a bit because now you, the game is effectively twice as long for you because you have two people to move across the path. And if you draw cards that aren't good for one explorer, well, in the, it, with three or four players, you're probably gonna buy something. If you can't move someone, you will buy something to improve your future movement possibilities. With two people, if I can't move him, maybe I can move him. And now I've got three choices. Move, move, buy. You can move one person with one card, move another with another card, buy something with remaining cards. You got more choices and more things to try to mix together. One additional element that comes into play is a variant that you use in which you stack four cave tiles at random on a cave space. And whenever you move an explorer adjacent to one of these spaces for the first time, you draw one of these tiles, reveal it, and put it in front of you and you use it when you decide to use it. If you want to get another one, you have to back away from the cave and then go forward again. You can't just circle around the cave and pick up all the stuff. 
and there will be movement points in particular colors and ways to remove cards from your hand or advance to a particular space and all the different elements that you will find in this game. And it's this additional little twist, this incentive to get you to do something you might not normally want to do. So do you want to approach this? Do you want to start off making this trek over to a cave in order to get uh, some bonuses that will be good later? Or do you just head across as quickly as you can? Additional choices for you. There's two things that really stand out for this game versus other deck building games. As I've already mentioned, it is a racing game. It's not just deck building. Things like Dominion or Ascension, they have a racing feel because of course you are trying to pile up points quicker than any other player. The game ends at a certain point, all the provinces are gone, or three piles are gone. So it has a race-like feel in that you see the piles diminishing and you know the ending is coming, but you don't know when. Right? Eldorado has a fixed point. Someone reaches Eldorado and that's it. You finish the round and then see who wins. But that racing element ties in more to the actual gameplay where you're moving through the forest. You have particular things that you're trying to do before other people can because, this gets into the second element, there is a lot of player interaction, not just in the market where you're deciding which cards go into play, which is going to affect what other people can buy and therefore do, but there are a lot of choke points on the board. So you look at any map on here and there's gonna be spots like this where there's a four village space surrounded by a three and then there's twos all around it. And if someone hasn't built up their deck, you know they have to go this long path. And if you see them headed in one direction and then you get in front of them, they're stuck, they can't do anything. Or you know that they have built up their hand, they've bought this four card and four village card and they're holding on to it you don't have to discard cards at the end of your turn you can keep it so i have this in my hand i'm going to build i'm going to build and plan to go through here and then other people come and they cut me off ah now i just have to sit there or i can wait to hope to go around and then i waste my four to get across this two space do i really want to do that uh. and there's these choices that come up over and over again as you're moving across the board with this forest space here with these three forest, three forest, you can make this big snaky path through here to more easily cover that land, but that takes a lot of time. This element comes up over and over again where you are really blocking people off and affecting what they wanna do because a lot of times you get a hand and you have this choice, well, I could move these particular spaces, but I've, I've got four coins once and I really wanna get this thing that I think is gonna be useful a few turns from now and probably again and again as I draw it. So do I wanna buy or do I wanna do that? Well, this turn I'll buy because I think these other cards are coming up that then will let me move through these other spots. And then someone moves in in front of you, blocks that path and now you're drawing the things that you wanted but are now not useful. And as you watch what people buy, you can pay attention to what they play from turn to turn, you get a sense for what's in their deck still, and you really get a flavor for what people can do and what you want to stop them from doing. And again, that's very different from a lot of deck building games where I can't directly affect what you do. Maybe I have cards that make you discard or I steal money or you know do things like that, but those are kind of generic. Those are kind of like, you know, hand reaching in from the ceiling and taking stuff from you. And it doesn't really matter that it's me doing it. It's just stuff being done to you. And here though, it's me doing it to you because I want to beat you to this goal. And if I get ahead of you in the right way with my deck set up for that, then hopefully I can maintain that lead and cut you off. And that's one thing I love about racing games. I, Ali Caesar is one of my favorite games and that game is all about being a jerk by you using your cards effectively getting in front of people and forcing them to make bad choices right giving them no alternative but to use their cards poorly and that element comes into play a lot in El Dorado where again you you try to force people to do the wrong thing with their cards I don't necessarily know what the right thing is because I think I've won once out of six games so far but you see this element come up over and over again, and hopefully I'm slowly learning and I will get better. And this is, again, 
uh, want to bring up one of the key things that Kenitia does. Kenitia, I praise him a lot just because I love a lot of his games, but he is, his, his thing that he does is make games that look superficially simple. And there's nothing to them. And yet the gameplay emerges as you play more and more, and you get a sense for what's possible in the game. And this does the same thing. It is a simple premise to what you're doing, but then when you see the possibilities and the choices that you have to make, turn after turn after turn. Whew. Okay. El Dorado.